It's the internet, you're busy, let's do this. Welcome to the Games Beat Decides podcast. This is the podcast where we decide everything about the world of games so you don't have to think for yourself. I'm your host, Jeffrey Grubb. With me is... Mike Minotti. How you feeling, Mike? Uh, good, you know. All things know. considered or just good yeah, overall? Yeah, let's look at... Uh, I mean, I'm good. I mean, yeah. things, my life hasn't changed too much. I'm a single homeowner in suburbia, uh who works from home so like yeah i i've mostly been doing good too because yeah same uh my life's pretty similar and it hasn't changed much um and you know you 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 at least like have like your wife home yeah she's home and she's like watching the kids so i have like more time to work almost Mm -hmm. uh but but like i you know it's when you start thinking about it like man if this goes really bad and and you know you could start going down that pit of despair it's like oh that could be um it could get pretty dark, but it's like there's so far. It just seems like if we just keep doing this stuff, we'll probably be okay. And I don't know. It, but like last night, I was like reading a thread, like, oh, millions of people could still die, and even if we come back out after this, uh, you know, with the coronavirus, and you know, we do everything right, when we come back out, people could still die because it could spike again. So it was like, it's been sobering. But in the so face really, of this, video games are still happening. <laughs> it's yeah. like so, so we're all doing the best that we can. We're doing the best that we can. Yeah, exactly. Although I do feel like I got like a little bit of a tickle in my throat. Like you might even hear it. Like I, like there's something happening. So maybe I'm sick, but not like I can go get tested. <laughs> what can I do? So I'm gonna do yeah. a podcast about video games. Is the answer to that question? Uh, go. We're gonna talk about some news. There's a lot of stuff happening this week. It was supposed to be GDC this week, uh, Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. That didn't happen. But a lot of the big events that were supposed to happen during that that during that conference, they're still happening just now online. Microsoft and Sony both are both doing stuff. Nvidia's got stuff happening this week, so we'll talk about all of that. Uh, and then we got a few games. I've been playing Animal Crossing, and I could talk about that in a review capacity now. So I'll have Mike ask me a bunch of questions, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Well, because I'm a, I'm like a, I'm a bit of an Animal Crossing skeptic. Yeah, I, and I, I don't hate Animal Crossing, but like I, I am one of people like I, like it seems like. There is a lot of, like, even before the Corona thing, to be honest, there seemed like there was extra hype for this one. And I, part of me is almost like, oh, okay. I, mean, I, I, I think that's nice. a good perspective to ask those questions from, because I think this game has a chance to appeal to you more than past games have. So. I'm getting that impression, so yeah, I want to ask you about that. We'll talk about all that. Uh, first, though, I want to thank everybody for joining us. You can get more from me and Mike at GameSpeed.com. If you have something to share with us, you can email the podcast at games plus podcast at VentureBeat.com. That's the plus sign, uh, not the word plus. If you're listening to this on the website Player Widget, you can subscribe to us. Or if you're listening on Twitch now, actually, um, uh, you can subscribe to the, the audio version of the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. If you like the show, rate us on Apple Podcasts. That helps people find the show. But also... Tell people about it. That also helps, apparently. Um, and then finally, thank you to Carlos Ayn, who is Insane in the Rain Music on YouTube for the use of our theme song. All right, Mike, let's uh, let's just get right into this news. Um, tell me all of the hardware specs for PlayStation 5 and Xbox One. <laughs> you don't want to ask me. I listened to that whole 50-minute thing, and I have learned nothing new about this. Yeah, I mean, both both five. Microsoft and X, and uh, PlayStation, Sony did this this week. And how do you feel now as compared to before for both of these systems? No different? <laughs> I, I, I am assured that they will both be more powerful than their predecessors. I think that's a pretty safe thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, I mean, mean, like, a lot of the I mean, a lot of this Sony thing was, you know, it was deep dive stuff that... You know, it wasn't for me, but it, it, at the same time, it almost seemed like they they were trying to, like, have their cake and eat it, too, with doing this kind of developer-focused talk, but also, like, pushing it on all of their mainstream channels. Like, you guys should all look at this, because this is the first PlayStation 5 news you've been getting in months. So right. It, it's, it's, like, the whole presentation is weird, but you can talk about the specs before we talk about the uh, the presentation of it. Yeah, so I think the big thing here uh, to take away from both of these things for PlayStation 5 and Xbox One is that um, they are both very powerful. They're very close in terms of their architecture. Uh, there are some differences, though, and the question remains how important and how like noticeable will those differences be. Uh, my guess is going to be pretty minimal for most games. Uh, so uh, we could dive into this a little bit. I, if you want like the detailed breakdown of the specs, we have that on GameSpeed.com. I wrote them. I even go uh, so far as to explain why each in- individual thing matters, if it does matter. Um, so uh, let's just do like the quick version here. Uh, 
we knew already both systems were going to use AMD, uh, like, APUs, which means, like, you know, a CPU and a GPU on a system on a chip. And th they use the same basic family of products. They're both using Zen 2 for the CPU, which is, like, the, the still the next-gen CPU from AMD. Those haven't even, like, come out. Oh, wait, no, Zen 2 has. I'm sorry, RDNA 2 for the GPU. That hasn't come out yet. But Zen 2 just came out. It's, like, the top-of-the-line CPUs right now for processing for just general computing and for gaming um the, the difference between the playstation 5 and the xbox one is a few uh gigahertz or a few like me like megahertz basically um the the xbox one runs at about 3.8 the playstation 5 runs about 3.5 3. but the playstation 5 can have a variable frequency i, I mean what matters here is that those numbers the, the xbox one or the xbox series x is bigger PlayStation 5 is still plenty close, and I don't think it's going to be... I don't think that's going to be the major difference in these two systems is CPU processing power. Um, the GPU, uh, they're both using AMD RDNA 2, and this is, like I said, the next-gen next GPU that hasn't launched yet. Uh, and these are very energy-efficient GPUs. They, are, they have a ton of performance per watt, which is an area where NVIDIA has always had a, an advantage in the, in the PC side of things, and just now with RDNA... Uh, and our DNA to AMD is starting to catch up there to the point where it's it's they're about on par, and that's very exciting because that means these systems can just push out a ton of of processing graphical power without having to be super loud, hopefully, um, and and just you know and and just in general, but they're going to have you know five six times the performance of we had last gen. Um, I, I again, this is like. When we're talking about graphics, I think we've reached a point of diminishing returns where we're not going to notice the differences too much, and the CPU jump is probably still going to be bigger because that's going to allow for more intricate worlds, bigger worlds. Uh, and to that end, the one area where PlayStation 5 seems to have an advantage over the uh, Xbox Series X is in terms of data throughput. And this is like this is very much in the weeds. Basically, the the, the PlayStation 5 has about twice the the, the data throughput of of the uh, xbox series x and that's not we're not going to notice that what basically data throughput just means how much information from a uh, from a, a save on the ssd can you push from the ssd into the processors per second um and having twice that twice the amount of the other console that's going to make a difference in the long run as games start getting to a point where they need that much data throughput. There's still going to be areas where that's going to matter, like loading and stuff, but uh, even with loading, that's going to come down to SSD speeds, and the Xbox Series X is faster than the PlayStation 5 there. I, I mean, I'm going back and forth kind of saying, oh, which yeah, just one? Just tell me which one's better. I know, God. yeah, exactly. And that's, it, it's, here's, here's how I broke it down on Twitter, and I think this is probably going to be accurate, but honestly, one of these things could matter more down the line, and they could change things, but here's how I put it on Twitter. If... That data throughput could m make a huge difference for some PlayStation 5 games, likely many exclusives. Uh, having worlds able to stream in, like, you know, huge chunks of data with a ton of detail uh, every second, that could make for some, like, super fast, very beautiful games that, are, that were impossible on previous generations. Uh, Xbox Series X is still going to be able to do that, maybe just not quite as fast as PlayStation 5. And then in other areas... Xbox Series X in terms of just raw compute and raw graphical processing uh, and just, you know, raw, raw you know, memory speeds for like at least 10 gigabytes of its 16 gigabytes, Xbox Series X has a slight advantage. And I think when we start doing those like third party game comparisons, I imagine that like you won't be able to know this, notice the difference unless you're looking at them side by side. And even then, you're probably going to need someone to point it out. And in most cases, though, I think the Xbox Series X is going to have a slight advantage. What does this all mean? Like, I mean, I, I don't think that anyone should make their their purchasing decision based on this. I mean, are you? It sounds like it's still just going to come down to content. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, yeah. they're going to be close. I mean, yeah, like, to me, like, so far, the biggest thing has just been some of, like, Microsoft's backward compatibility stuff sounding a little bit more exciting than what PlayStation 5's trying to do. Like, PlayStation 5 has basically just said most PlayStation 4 games will work, whereas, you know, Microsoft's like, oh, these games are going to be running so much better, everything will work, and, you know, the Xbox 360, and even original Xbox games that work on Xbox One will also work here. So, like, that's, I don't know, that's just, like, more tangible to me than teraflops and, you know, pushing data through wires or, or whatever you were talking about. Yes. Uh, so, I think, um, like, even if you look back to last generation, 
Mark Cerny did, did this exact same presentation in 2013 before the PlayStation 4 launched. And, like, you could tell how many people don't remember that or weren't paying attention and how, like, how little it mattered that, like, he came out and did this really great conversation about, like, how, how great the specs were for the PlayStation 4, and they were great. Uh, they were, it was really good for developers. But, like, no one remembers that because as soon as you start talking about games, as soon as you start showing off games, that dominates the conversation because that's actually what's important. That's actually what, what matters. Um, this stuff is still fun, though. I get it. A lot of people do like going, like, digging into the to, into these things. It's, it's not like it doesn't matter. Right. It matters. But it matters. It's just, you know, it's, some, it's not... It's sometimes not very exciting, and it's hard to make it tangible. Yeah, and I think it's going to matter more to uh, developers. I think the, I think the um, the differences in these systems, uh, developers are going to care more when like depending on what kind of game they're trying to make. If you're trying to make a certain kind of game that the PlayStation Five can do better, like this is going to be a huge deal for you. Um, I still think most mass market like AAA blockbuster games are going to they're going to like the lowest common denominator. And even in that case, uh, it's going to be a huge leap. And just in terms of, again, like the size of worlds, the speed that these worlds are going to load in. I think just in terms of fidelity, we won't notice huge changes. Maybe ray tracing will change that. Um, both these systems do have hardware ray tracing. Ray, ray tracing. We haven't heard a ton about like how that's going to work because AMD hasn't shown off their hardware ray tracing and their GPUs yet. Uh, and ray tracing, just for people who know, that's like simulating the actual behavior of light in a video game world in the same way that it works in the real world. And it makes for very realistic looking images, uh, but consoles haven't been able to do it. PCs are still struggling to do it. Uh, so yeah, that, that could make, that could be like the different differentiating factor in terms of like really making games look better than the current generation. But other than that, like we're going to get higher resolutions. We're going to get better frame rates. And you, you may be talking about why such a big deal was made about the 3d audio thing. Cause Hasn't 3D audio been a thing already for so a the, while? Is so, this that exciting? So yes and no, it's been a thing. Um, 3D audio, so there's different kinds of 3D audio. So right now, a lot of uh, the 3D audio that we have is positional audio. And and positional audio, and this means like, normally when a, when a developer makes a video game, back in the day like of like Dolby Pro Logic 2 or whatever, uh, or, or just older audio uh, systems, they would not like have an object in space that was actually emitting sound that, like to create surround sound. They would just say, OK, for this object in this space, uh, the, le- the back left speaker is going to be this loud. The front speaker is going to be that loud, whatever. We're, we're just we're changing dials. Uh, the current 3D audio that we have now, the positional audio with um, uh, uh, Dolby Atmos, things like that, that's stuff that can like position actual objects in 3D space. And then Atmos calculates where it's at, knows where it's at. And it can uh, address like how loud and like what the sound should sound like when it reaches you, the player, in a certain position. Uh, so it's object-based 3D audio. What Sony's talking about is sort of it's building on that, but it's also different. They're talking about 3D ray traced audio, where not only is the is the sound emitting from an object in 3D space, it's also that sound is then going to bounce around all the other objects in its space. And then the, the sound that eventually reaches you is like, oh, so now there's like, you know, there's a gunshot happening over here. But what happens when it also bounces against that wall and, oh, it's behind a, it's behind a bookshelf. And so the, the sound waves have to bounce off that before it reaches you. And what does that sound like? How is that going to change the way the sound actually works? And it should be, uh, just like with ray traced lighting, it should make for a much more realistic and immersive a simulation of what sound actually does and that could be a, a huge leap forward now again this is something we have had but it's been it's been sparingly used almost never used in in, in most games um it, it, so it's not like this oh like sony's invented this new tech they're using something that existed but i mean it's something mark sarney said is the the rising tide lifts all boats thing by putting this stuff in consoles it's going to make it so more and more games are going to have it, and then PC will be able to take advantage of it in a way that they, that it hasn't before. So it, it's it's exciting. I think I think Mark Cerny is right to be pretty excited about it. Audio, though, I mean, it's always difficult to sell audio, right? Most people just use their TV speakers, and they don't know what they're missing out on because you can't put a TV commercial out that like explains what you're missing because you're still listening to it on your TV speakers. So, so we'll see. I mean, it's exciting though. I think you're you're still muted, Mike. Yeah, my mistake. My like with so much of my gaming being like portable on the Switch lately, like using those speakers. It's you know, it's not at like at any point 
I'm like, oh man, if only you know my sound quality was better. It, it's one of the things like when it's better, it's better. But yeah, you, you don't miss it a lot, I guess. You know? Yeah, I think, I think that when if you listen to something on a really good sound system, you'll notice the difference. But then when you're not, like it's 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 one of the first things that's really easy to sacrifice. I think is what is what you're saying there, and I agree. Um, and most people agree. Most people are just not going to spend the money on on a sound system, which is again, this works. Um, like with like ray tracing lighting you don't have to buy a new screen you don't have, to have an 8k screen to get the effects of a tra- uh, of ray tracing it's going to look just as good on a crt as it does on anything else it's just going to make the actual picture more realistic with this 3d ray traced audio it's the same thing if you're listening to it with just headphones regular stereo headphones it's still going to be just as it's like just as eff- as effective and feel that more more mu- that much more realistic because all the processing's happening before it reaches your ear and that's like where the magic is happening so so this could be cool like even people with like poor audio setups still are going to get a pretty big advantage all right um any other questions here that we should like touch on i feel i mean i, I don't blame you if you don't have anything uh, i'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll both be pretty strong they'll yeah be- you know, I mean, we did powerful. get the, the release date for Xbox One, I guess, Thanksgiving. Uh, kind of. Maybe not now. <laughs> so what do they say? Clarify. Well, so they, they like, made this – there's this site. I don't – I think this site is new. And at the bottom it said coming Thanksgiving 2020, which is a good deal more specific than the old, like, holiday or quarter four. So I wrote that story. And then literally while we are doing this podcast, I just was, was kind of uh, messaging uh, – from the staff, not from Microsoft, I haven't heard from them yet, that it's been switched back to holiday 2020. Okay. All so, right. well, I had to update that st- while you were spouting some specs, I had to update that story real quick. So it's like, no, no worries. I mean, it's almost certainly coming out around Thanksgiving still. Yeah, before Thanksgiving, if they can manage it. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's going to be November. I don't know what the heck that was about, though, all of a sudden there. Why they. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, that, they've got, I think that site is new, so, huh. All right, well, f- fair enough. I, it's definitely coming holiday, though. We know that much. All it'll right. Be, um, it'll be coming. Yeah, we, I'm very confident saying it'll specifically be, like, you know. I mean, play, Xbox 360 and the Xbox One both came out on November 22nd. Right. For context. Pretty much everything has come out in November, except for, like, the Switch, which was, you know, sort of a an interesting case because it had to make up for a failed console. That's right. Okay. All right, I think we can uh, we can move along now. We're talking uh, about the, the like the presentation of what they did. With, you're right. We should talk about that. Five. So, like the weird mystery science theater. Thing. Yeah. So this was supposed to happen during GDC. This was supposed to be Mark Cerny's address to game developers. I think maybe Sony still would have like live streamed that possibly, uh, and maybe they would have even like made a big deal of it to their typical audience. Uh, but without like GDC, like they have just been positioning this as. This is a way to find out the first real concrete details about the PlayStation 5. And it was weird, right? It it was weird. Uh, I mean, the, the, I, I understand what they were trying to do. Like, they, I mean, the, my, my issue is that they didn't, like, it seems like they reconsidered almost nothing with, like, the kind of new audience, right? Like, it was just a GDC talk, even though it's not really a GDC talk anymore and then you kind of have the weird like fake audio i think that wasn't even like real people i don't know it was really hard to tell but it did look like mystery science theater 3000 cutouts almost right so you had like mark sony talking in front of a a fake audience and you know he has this really he has this very nice calming voice but i I don't know if maybe that's counterproductive to the hype that needs to be built for the system right now like like nothing about that presentation was exciting it, it was interesting Correct. it was informative it was not exciting and i think sony is like maybe struggling right now to build excitement like it, maybe they could have done more it would have been better if they made a big deal about like here's where we're going to show what the playstation 5 looks like and then also by the way if you're like interested in like you know going deep into the specs this thing's happening but here's the exciting thing that you probably care about plus it was also weird like as soon as the video went live Eurogamer just posted their right story about the specs anyway so i was like oh here it is and it had all of the i think it might have just been like a to me it looked like they were taking exact quotes from his presentation so either he's just repeating quotes that he was already giving Eurogamer, or they also just watched that same video and then maybe got to ask a few more questions to clarify things but it was like seemed like it was all based off of that stuff so it was like i was watch. i'm like reading the article and i have it on in the background and it's like he's saying something that i'm reading right in front of me like verbatim so it was just it was weird, and, like, 
I like Sony fans didn't seem to like it. They seemed pretty upset, like, uh, you know, upset to a point. Like, I think a, a lot of people probably get it. Some Sony fans, like in the, the YouTube chat and stuff, were just like spamming Z, 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 right. Z. And like, I mean, you know, chat for these things is always kind of rough. Always but bad. It can't be indicative of a feeling, you know, you know. Part of the issue is that we have not heard much about the PlayStation Five, especially compared to the the Xbox Series X. So, I, right, I we, we've seen the Series it. X, right? We've seen the box. Right. We, we... We've seen the box. We know what the controller looks like. We've we've gotten specs a bit ago, and you know some other things. Whereas, yeah, well, there's there's still a lot of questions about Sony's thing. And and the way that Microsoft like revealed the, the like the detailed specs, like they just did that on Monday, right? And that was uh, just a blog post. Like there was no video. I can't remember if there was a video. There was like two. There were like two like really short video like demonstrations. Like, oh, here's quick resume, which we didn't talk about, but like we've talked about it before. Sure. And um and and, and load times and stuff. And those are like we've seen PlayStation 5's load times like demonstrated before as well. So, I I get it. But there was no like like Phil Spencer standing in front of a, a fake audience or a real audience or even like a Nintendo Direct style thing. It was just a blog post with like here is the whole business. And also, if you want more details in a video form, here's Digital Foundry actually doing that. Yeah. And, I that works like better. They yeah, they should have just either been a little bit better about communicating what this was going to be yeah. or retooling it a bit, kind of considering the circumstances, I, I suppose. I mean, does it matter? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, again, like, Mark Cerny did the same thing with, like, a pretty similar tone. I, and f- of course, it was in front of an audience, and that seemed to work better. Uh, and, you know, and I can't remember, like, that, that Mark Cerny presentation in 2013 might have been, like, sandwiched around, like, other details about the PS4. I think it might have been so like like it was, like they didn't have like price at that time, but I think they also showed some games so that this was just like just the technical stuff. And it's like even people who are huge Sony fans that are like are reasonable people that aren't spamming in chat or whatever. They seemed like, what am I supposed to do with this? And the answer is like, you're not actually supposed to do a lot with this. You pro- you're not going to if you're a Sony fan, this is not going to sway you one way or the other. Like you were already probably going to get a PS5. You just care about like them announcing Horizon Zero Dawn 2 in the launch window or whatever. That's going to be what gets most people to, like, actually slap down their $400, $500 or whatever. So, so yeah. Um, I, last thing about this is, uh, like, what does all this mean for price? Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think that, like, the Xbox One is clearly more expensive to make. Or Xbox Series X. I'm going to just keep messing that up. Yeah. The Xbox Series X is going to be more expensive to make. Um, but I, I still would be... And, like... That doesn't mean like the PlayStation Five is cheap. Like it's very, it's still going to be very expensive. Uh, those components are all pricey, uh, and they're not and they're not going to go down in price as like production like continue, continues to, like to meet with uh, difficulties due to coronavirus. So I don't know. I, I, to me, like I think that PlayStation Five is at least going to be five hundred dollars, and then Xbox Series X would either have to match that at a loss or come in at more. And it's like five fifty, six hundred. That starts to get way up there. So I don't know. It's tough, but they won't announce that to like the last possible moment. Uh, maybe at E3, but they might even wait a little bit longer because uh, they're going to try to see like how far they can get. They can push down that price because that's going to be a big factor in determining like people's decision. And, and they have the design locked down on the PlayStation Five, right? They're just not showing. Like, you, yeah. you think is there any chance they just oh. don't like they're not sure yet? They might be like there might. Th- I think they. I think they know the general form factor. There might be like a couple revisions, but that could still happen with the Series X too. So I, so yeah, basically they're in the same position. I would imagine there's no way that they don't that they're still like, what is this thing gonna look like on the outside? We don't know. We have no idea. We got fifty like choices here. We got to pick one of them. I don't think they're <laughs> at that point. So yeah. All sure. right. Um, a couple other things happened over the last week or so. Uh, the Nintendo Indie World Showcase, uh, happened, and it was you know it was an okay show. I think um. Was it yeah. super exciting? But like, I, I mean, there was a lot of good looking games. Especially, right. what was that opening game that was like the 3D ninja pl- action platformer? That looked great. I can't remember the exact name. I remember yeah. Baldo after that looked good. I thought that, like the first like six or seven games were all like those look really great, and I can't wait to pick those up. So there's, but there was no like so like you know last year we got the Cadence of Hyrule, and the right. year before that we got Cuphead. There was nothing like that this time, which was a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. So. They ended with like one more thing, and it was exit the gungeon. And I know enter the gungeon. We one more thing because that's out on Apple Arcade. That's not right. That big a deal. Yes. Uh, yeah. Totally. And I. I like. I know a lot of people like 
enter the gungeon. I, I'm just not a huge fan one way or the other. I, I, I haven't played it enough to like decide whether or not I actually like it or not, but I'm like, okay, this is a sequel to a game I haven't really played, so... Okay. See, I, I would have been expecting, like, we're letting the Enter the Gudgeon people make some kind of Metroid thing or something. Not Sure, just, yeah. Like, here's their game, their latest game that came out on another platform is coming to Switch. As... Right. And it was like... I, like you know, it's like they forced the one more thing when they didn't really have a one more yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, I, for some people, I guess Exit the, Gun- the Gudgeon could be that, like, in terms of, like, people who are fans of indie games. Uh, it, it, was, it was definitely bigger than most of the other games in terms of, like, brand recognition and stuff like that, but... I, I don't know. I agree. It's like if they had Swan Song or uh, what is it? Uh, Silk Silk Song, um, the sequel to Hollow Knight. If they had that ready to go and they had a release oh, date, man. they could have ended yeah. the whole show with that, and that would have been a big deal. But mm-hmm. apparently, you know, that's not ready. So we'll see. Uh, not much else to say there, other than like with this happening. This, I, I, you know, as far as I can, I, you know, last I heard, the March twenty sixth general Nintendo Direct is still happening. So uh, that's you know, I. I Reported that last week, the, and I said it was also going to come with an indie world first this you know this past week or you know your reputation week. is on the line. I know, you know, I, I, and as far as I know, it's still happening. It's like things could be like if things get really bad, maybe they'll like pull the plug, but they haven't done that yet, as far as I heard. So, uh, yeah, pretty excited. Any, any guesses, Mike, about what's going to be there? Uh, I'm hoping we finally get the Metroid like prime trilogy announced yeah, uh i, I mean like not, so. i feel like we yeah we got to see something of breath of the wild too aside from like like crazy guesses well did you see that the the the, the, the like cam girl that like <laughs> yeah the one that's following me now thanks a lot yeah you're welcome she's great <laughs> she like was like oh yeah e3 is gonna be canceled and then it was canceled and now she's like oh that the same guy that like told me e3 was uh, gonna be canceled i think she calls him her like titty pay pig or something like that sorry very about nice me. yeah exactly uh he, he, she said that he said that this nintendo direct is going to have a teaser for breath of the wild 2 and uh, uh something else i can't remember but that's what i got excited about um, i trust mario, you now right? fully this she knows what she's talking about so there's there's been a paper mario rumored for a while now like an actual is that what it, yeah that, that, got, that might have been what she said i can't remember an actual paper, which i would be very excited like like i don't want to get too excited because again like my love for uh, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door is like way up here, and then like all oh, those Paper Mario yeah. games afterwards is like eh, not so much. So, right, but the rumor like... was always this is going back to its roots, and that would be its roots. So, I yeah, I have high hopes. We'll see. All right, and then uh, it's like another news story that doesn't have a lot to it: MPD sales um, from February uh, sales were down again. Um, that's because there was very few new releases. Like I, no new release actually finished in the top twenty for the software chart, um, and and then yeah yeah so console sales with console sales are also down and you know software sales are down uh one notable thing is accessories and game cards that dropped like 12 percent or, or in that range and that's like i think that's a sign that like we really are like fully coming down from the high of like Fortnite and apex legends and you know all those that like people are showing up the stores to buy new controllers new headsets game cards to like purchase in-game items or whatever and there was a huge frenzy for that and it's like that like at its peak, like that was way, that was a huge, huge deal that was making a ton of money for the industry and you know selling a lot of accessories. That's coming back down to earth now, and so at a much more reasonable level. I think it's still like historically, it's still like accessories and game cards are still pretty high, uh, but like just compared to the height of Fortnite, yeah. it's it's nothing. So it's interesting. Like we're kind of getting to this point where we can kind of look back on like that period where Fortnite was just like took over the world for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, not much else to say there. Um, like, like no new game, no, like no new games to talk about. I mean, Switch was the top selling hardware, but of course, like those yeah, older consoles are on the way out. It makes sense. So we'll see. Did you see yesterday that uh, Microsoft and the Microsoft Store sold the Xbox One X for two hundred dollars for a few hours? Not even a few hours. It was like they put it up and it sold out within minutes or whatever. Really? But, yeah, it was weird. Like, yeah. why, why would they? Why would they do that? I don't know. I wonder if it was a mistake, but it doesn't seem like it. So. A mistake? Who knows? Yeah. Somebody um, working from home pushed the wrong button. Yeah, exactly. That's probably what it was. Um, a cat like got on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just a couple of quick news stories, and we'll get out of here uh, to the like what we've been playing section. Uh, Resident Evil Three demo is launching on March nineteenth. That's tomorrow. Um, Isn't it interesting how demos seem to be making a comeback? Yeah, and I, I wonder if like they've seen like. I wonder if they've seen like how that has helped. I wonder if it is helping sales. I, well. The, the old like things be like oh demos just to get like convince people or give people reasons not to buy a game. Right. right? It seems like if you're real confident in the project, mm-hmm. it seems like a demo is is fine. Like for Final Fantasy VII, 
or this. Like, you know, I think there's a certain level of quality that they know they've reached. So it's like, yeah, sure. Definitely yeah, and, and more games, I think, are going to enable people to um, pick up their saves in the, from, the like, where a demo ends. So maybe this game will do that, and that could, like, help. Like, oh, I'm, I've already got a save, like, from the demo. I could just pick up from there, just spend the 60 bucks and get to keep playing. So maybe maybe that'll happen, and maybe that'll help. Um, what do you think of this Lego Super Mario thing? Uh, not for me, I don't think. Not really. yeah, like, I, mean, I like video games, and I like Lego. I even like some Lego video games. I don't know about this, like, weird, like, real Lego, but kind of. like I'd rather just make Princess Peach's Castle than, like, have this kind of a game with, like, Mario with an LED screen thing tied into it. You gotta say that all again. But you gotta say it with a much whinier voice and much more entitled. Like, I'm an adult wow. and I need Legos for adults. I want to build a <laughs> castle. This is a kid's like... toy. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I like. I love I don't kids disagree with toys. You. That's, yeah. That's, like most of my life is kids toys. <laughs> like I'd rather like if I was gonna build like a Lego thing, I want to get like one of the big like I'll build Cinderella's castle from Disney World or you know yeah. a, a a Death Star or something. Not like a a. a a course like a level course i guess i think it um i think it looks like a very cool toy and i I'm, I'm, my kids will kids love it, love it yeah. my kids will love it so i'll absolutely get it for them and you know we'll see and i, I think it's interesting though that, like when din- like when t- nintendo does a partnership like like this they always want to come in and be like no we, it has to be different it can't just be like everything else we're gonna like actually come in here and help you figure out what it should be let's make a really uh, a different kind of lego experience so um, I think I like that too. I think that's pretty inter- interesting. Um, but yeah, I'll get it for my kids and play with it for a little bit, and I'm sure it'll be interesting. Maybe hack it and see what we could do with those weird screens. Hack it's it. Got, yeah, it's got like the LCD screen on its chest and it's Make mouth Mario and say eyes. Fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, bro. Um, cool. I, I also hope like this does lead to like more Lego Nintendo stuff, and like, maybe a, like a Lego Nintendo game. I think that could be cool too. I think that does it for the news. We, uh, we can just hop to what we've been playing. Uh, and you haven't been playing much, right? I haven't, I've been, you know, playing more Dragon Quest, a lot of World of Warcraft. Uh, with all of them. And I've been playing something I can't talk about for review. I have not been able to start Doom, sadly. Yeah. Which I have killed because I've been doing this other thing for work. So, yeah, I can't talk about it. If you use your imagination, you can probably figure out what it is. But uh, <laughs> next week I should be able to, I think. Yeah, I'm, me too, by next week. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about Doom then. Uh, another plenty big game to talk about yeah uh animal crossing new horizons so i've uh i've been playing this since february 29th uh, i po- i posted my review i i love it it's a it's a great game in general it's a great animal crossing game uh i think like the shorthand here is it's the best animal crossing game yet um should i like give it like a general description here or do you want to start just asking questions well i just want to i guess I just want to ask questions because i mean one of the things you were kind of been harping on is how much better the sort of like first day experience yeah the first couple weeks yeah Yeah. what you want to talk about like because you know in the past games you basically you 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 get into town you introduce to some of the systems you get like your first little house and there's not too much to do those first days you kind of yes like typically you like go around you talk to everybody you get a few bugs or something and uh maybe i can't remember you can just go fishing right away but they're not i don't think so yeah um so like the progression in like New Leaf was, you're gonna kind of get to the end of your like rope of things to do on the first day after like the first hour, and then you're gonna have to wait for the following days to get certain tools to start opening up stuff like fishing and bug catching and stuff like that. Um, this game uh, does a, a, a lot, it, it, quite a bit differently. Um, you're gonna get most of your basic tools on the first day, so uh, even like after you get through the tutorial session section, which is an untimed day. So it's, it has nothing to do with the real world calendar. Uh, and it just like runs you through the basics and it's just like, Tom looks like, okay, go shake a tree to get these very basic building blocks for the crafting system and go get this fruit and like, you know, maybe sell it to Timmy and Tommy or whatever. Um, once you get through that tutorial, you have, you should be able to build or you should already have like the fishing pole, the, the, the net, um, you know, a, a few other things. And, from there, like the, the 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 game unfolds by unlocking more stuff over the days uh, that either change the way the game plays or like expands on the the current like available like shops and buildings that you can interact with. Um, and this this like the way it doles this stuff out is very satisfying and very well done. Where on that first day, I was able to just like collect as many like fruit as I could find. I was able to start like crafting 
Um, I was able to go fishing all night and just like collect getting bells by selling them to Timmy and Tommy, uh, selling everything I was getting. And I played for like six or seven hours on the first day in a way that I didn't with uh, with the past games. The the next day you come back and like now you have a chance to like say, hey, Timmy, Tommy, let's build you a shop so that you can like do more and sell me more and, and like buy more stuff from me. Uh, and then that becomes a quest where it's like, you know, it's not like a huge, like expanding quest or anything like that, but it is, we need 30 iron. We need 30 of this kind of wood, 30 of that kind of wood and 30 of a third kind of wood. Um, and that could take some time that might even require you to go to some of the like uh, procedurally generated islands and get some resources from there, bring it back to your island and get, give these bundles to them. And then now they're going to build their shop and that's going to take a day. Meanwhile, you could be collecting all of the, uh, the, you know, the bugs and the fish, and you're taking those to Tom Nook at the start. And once you get to a certain point of giving him so many of these fish and stuff to go into a museum, uh, he'll invite Blathers there to, to, the, to the town, and then Blathers will take so many, and then he'll decide to build a museum, and that takes a day. And it's just, you are consistently just pushing your town and expanding it further and further. But it is, you know, even after, like, like a little bit more than two weeks that I've been playing, um... The, 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 like, this is not, like, I haven't, like, reached the end of this whole, like, this progression path yet. It's clear that there are multiple levels of, like, expanding the buildings, like the shops, like Timmy and Tommy's shop or whatever. Uh, Nook and Cranny is what it's called right now. And this was in past games and stuff like that. Uh, but, like, you're, the, through doing this, you, like, you're seeing, like, your town change and grow. And you begin to take more ownership of this. And the game does a really good job of focusing on this aspect by adding... Uh, now you're not just decorating your house, you are building decorations to go outside, and you are building, like, you're building up, like, the decor of your island, and I've, I've, like, for example, uh, over on, like, the, the, the beach on my east side of the island, I've started making sort of, like, a fairgrounds, I have, like, a teacup ride, and a jungle gym, and, Ooh. like, a tricycle, and there's, a, like, a, a vending machine, and a soda pop machine, and uh, all, it's just stuff like that, and I've, I've built, like, gates, iron gates to go all around it and stuff, and all of this is working towards making the island more more appealing to uh, both attract more villagers, but also to attract like a special guest, which I still can't talk about who that is. Is but... that like Viva Pinata esque ish? So n no, Viva Pinata worked like where you had to have very specific, you had to meet very specific requirements to attract very specific uh, animals. This is much more like you are just you're designing the town that you want that you think would look cool. And you're getting, like, a sort of just a five-star rating about, like, oh, there's no, like, oh, if you put this one thing in your world, it's going to have an effect and attract this this one type of villager, at least as far as I know. And that's definitely not how they're presenting it. Isabel, is that, is this the big secret? Uh, no, is, Isabel her. comes uh, early on, uh, yeah, without... Isabel, Isabel. Is, you know, yeah, no worries. Uh, she, she comes completely separate, and she, like, is working in the main office, just like always, and, uh, and, and, and it's great. She's still great. Um... But like so, you know, there's this overarching progression, and and, and the, these overarching quests, and I don't think that they are so like um, demanding that it feels like oh now Animal Crossing is a quest based game. It's not like that. It's just some guidance to like make you feel like you're always working towards something. But then on, on the other hand, like they have like the and these are, like the you know long term goals. But each day and each moment has this really rewarding system called Nook Miles. Excuse me, and Nook Miles is a, um, a secondary currency to the bells that you earn. By doing everything else in the game. So you earn bells by like selling fish to Timmy and Tommy or whatever. Just selling stuff. Miles you earn by like just going around talking to people. Or watering flowers. Or chopping down wood. Or crafting. Or customizing. Or using the and design what do you spend tool. spend miles on? Is it like the same things? No. So there's a separate store uh, that, that Tom Nook runs in the residence center. And, and he's got, like, a list of stuff that's, like, kind of, like, specialized goods. And sometimes they're, like, really exciting things that you can, like, decorate either your house or your island with. And you exchange Nook Miles for, for that. But you can also get stuff like um, the Nook Miles ticket to travel to the island for, like, 2,000 Nook, uh, Nook Miles. Uh, and that enables you to, like, go to these special islands where you could just, like, clear, clear cut everything, bring it back to your island, and, and uh, get extra resources. Um, and and I, I still feel like... This is going to get bigger, and, like, there's going to be more stuff for me to spend Nook Miles on in the future, but so far I haven't, like, tiered up or anything like that. But the reason this works so well is, like, you see, like, there's the, on your, like, Nook phone, smartphone, you are always seeing the meters that you're filling up as you're progressing, as you're progressing and doing various things around the island. Uh, and everything you do is getting these tiny little rewards, and it just builds up over time, and it all feels great. It, it has me doing things like tending a garden 
of flowers, which I wouldn't have done in previous games, just because it, you know, it's it comes up on my like list of challenges. Uh, and like, there's like multiple ways that they dole out these Nook Miles too, where it's like there there are the long term like sort of um I guess like a subway sandwich card where you're just punching it out over time and like okay now you got ten and you could exchange that for a free sandwich and. Yeah, and then, okay, next time, on the next tier, it's like, oh, you got to get 50 punches, and then you get a, a bigger reward. And that's like, okay, that's great. But then each day you start out, they give you a five, uh, like, much more, like, uh, uh, pared down versions of these tasks where it's like, just catch five fish. And the first five you get each day of these kinds of uh, uh, rewards is uh, double points. You get double points for them. And then once you clear those out, they all get replaced with similar size tasks, but you don't get the bonuses anymore. So it's like... A reason well, to check in each day. Fan, it's not, these sound like dailies. Exactly. Da- yeah. Yes, they're they're dailies, but it's like you don't you're, you're never going to run out of dailies. Like it's not like oh just yeah. do your dailies, but there there are bonus rewards for like what I would call the dailies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely, and it's so it's like all these systems working together to just make the game feel so much more rewarding than past Animal Crossing games. Very sticky, very gripping. I want to. I just keep wanting to go back. And it has me things like it has me doing things like imagining what I want my island to look like like six months from now, where I am, like I'm putting I'm putting stuff in place. I ha- I'm putting bridges in place. I'm working with Tom Nook to establish this infrastructure where there's like ramps to get up to the high ground or whatever. And there, there's a couple of bridges, uh, and, and and that that's taking time. But these are like this is like the bare bones infrastructure where I, I think I I, I heard uh, on a podcast I can't remember who said it uh, that it was like. It's like the 1955 version of the Back to the Future town, and like you're gonna like you're trying to build up to the 1985 version, where it's like okay, here was there was always a bridge here, but now there's also all this other stuff around it, and I am like envisioning that version of my town in this game as I'm playing and putting stuff in place slowly over time, and it's just it feels really nice. It's just super rewarding. So, so one thing I've heard is you know. You, you seem to have a much greater effect on like the island itself yeah. and like kind of changing it or to, you know for the things you're in charge of i see some people kind of like i don't know if complaints were but criticized like uh you know we've, they it's moved away from the original animal crossing where you're just a villager literally built you know living in a town and now you're like the god of this area does that bother you at all or do, or do you like kind of having this more control so uh I, I don't to me it feels like it was always this is the way it should have always been um decorating your house is still nice and still great but it feels like very um small compared to actually getting a chance to build up the island and, and I think that's one of the reasons why i was never super like that was just never quite enough for me yes to keep me engaged like going around talking to people catching some like i understand why for some people like that was like super like fun and relaxing but mm-hmm. for me i was like i wish there was actually more for me to do here yeah, and, and I, I like I wonder if you could still play it that way. I think that uh, some of this progression is tied to completing some of these quests, and many of these quests are about like improving the overall appeal of the island. Uh, so so maybe not, but I feel like most people are going to be like, no, this this completely fits in with the overall idea of what Animal Crossing always was. Just sort of customizing things to your to your like to exactly your specifications, um, and and this game has has that and it does it really well. I, you know, if I'm not going to say like universally, like everyone who's always loved Animal Crossing is going to love this game. I will be surprised, though, if if like 95 percent don't like like 95 percent of people who've always loved the series are going to continue coming back to this and be like, oh, this is the best one yet. And then I think also on top of that, people who have bounced off for various reasons, but can like see the appeal. This might this one might be the one where it's like just sticky enough to keep people around and really get people into the idea of like, oh, I see why people always like this. There's all these other things here that like I that were they were there before, but they just didn't have those immediate rewards and they didn't feel as good. And I wasn't sure why I was doing anything. If that was if that was you or anyone else listening, I think that maybe this is the one to like jump back in on and give it another chance. I, you know, it's sixty dollars. I, I get that. If you're still hesitant, if you think you know, oh, you know, I never liked Animal Crossing before. I don't think I'm gonna like this one. Like I'm not telling you to definitely go out and spend sixty dollars. I just think it has a better chance of winning over more people than, than ever before. How's the like islandness of it? Does it is it have like a pretty distinct feel, like just kind of aesthetically from the past games because of the whole island thing? Uh, a little bit. Like there's um, there's definitely like more parts of the island. Uh, this is another good part of the progression is that it starts you off on like the inside of a river that cuts the the island in two. Um, and then eventually once you get blathers to the island, you can get a tool to get over the river 
and that opens up okay like all, there's all these other things now on this other side of the island and as you go further north like it starts uh, there are um tiered heights that uh, almost like highlands or, or mountains or whatever and you need to get a ladder to get up there and the, those those highlands might have different kinds of trees uh and just a different visual appeal it's not or a different visual style it's not hugely different but it's it's just slight it's a, a slight bit of variety that keeps things feeling fresh um and i've you know, I like that from the terms of like, oh, I, you know, it took me days to get to the side of the island. And that's really cool that like, OK, I'm still discovering more about this own this place that I actually live. Um, but in terms of like. Whether or not it's a, a, it feels like, OK, this this is an island and that was different than like city folk or whatever or, or New Leaf, which was just like this little forest town. It's not too different. Um, I think it's still going to come down to uh, you customizing the island to how you want it to look. That's going to be way more important than sort of the island feel. Um, and, and I think the, another reason for that is that I think they still want it to feel like Animal Crossing and they still want like, like this is like a temperate zone island, right? Apparently there's going to be, there's still going to be seasons with snow and fall and all this other stuff. So it's not so, like, you know, it's not, everything doesn't suddenly look like Hawaii. Right. It's not like a tropical island. They're not trying to do that, but you could make parts of your island look like, you know, the, the tropics. I've, I've, I got some bamboo and I started growing bamboo on one side of my island. Uh, specifically, like you know, yeah, down by the beach. Make everything look like Adventureland from Disneyland. So, well, yeah, go for it. I, I think you I could do, do that. It. Yeah, you could do a hub and spoke design or whatever, like they do. Yeah, yeah this was just one land, Jeff. God, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah, I know you don't know. I don't know anything. Yeah, um, obviously. it's a good game though. It's it's I I I have played it for about like sixty hours between the uh, the two consoles uh that i have uh like just trying like to start a new village like on my family console where everyone's gonna play and then on my main game on switch Lite, and i just i could i intend to keep playing regularly through the end of the year like without a doubt like it's um it's just been really great i i I to try it see if i always have liked animal crossing uh but it's just it's really nice to like see them nail it and just get it so right and just sort of refine it to a point where it's like oh like even if i was feeling burnt out on the series uh, I would. This would just get me right back into it without a doubt. For sure, it sure seems positioned to be an especially big hit for them, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does, without a doubt. Um, uh, only things I don't like. Uh, that save system is pretty frustrating. Um, this is not going to affect everyone the same way. For me, it was like, okay, I do have my Switch Lite where I was playing my main game on, and it's like, oh, I wanted to record some gameplay, uh, on on the main Switch. And I can't take my character, I can't take anything I've done on the Switch Lite over to the main Switch and continue to play it there. I have to start the game over on a whole new island with a whole new character. It's it's just completely separate. Now, mo- again, most people that are not going to have that issue, but more like more and more families are going to have multiple Switches in their home. And uh, the idea of like you know a, a kid playing on their Switch Lite, playing on their island, and now everyone's going to go play the one on the TV. And they have to start a whole new character that is complete, like has nothing to do with what they've com- like they've d- done or completed in the main version of their game. Uh, that seems kind of I don't know. It seems bad. Like it seems it not obnoxious. Great. Yeah, like I would at least like having the option to just bring my character over, even if the island isn't different or it, it isn't the same. I'm sorry. Um, and then the only other thing, it, it's clunky. Like it's still Animal Crossing. Uh, I posted a video on Twitter of me fishing. And I couldn't get the fish, like I couldn't get the line to land right in front of the fish for the life of me. And it took me like a, like more than a minute to catch the fish, uh, and that could be frustrating. And and it and this sort of thing manifests throughout the game with some like the, oh one too many menus every once in a while, or uh, the crafting. You can only craft one thing at a time, and you can't queue that queue up like a crafting thing where it's like okay, build this, then this, then this. No, it's like we're gonna build this right now. Confirm yes. Watch him do the animation. You get it. Hey, look, he's got it. All right, now you want to keep crafting. <laughs> yeah, yes. Right, yeah. yeah, and you, you just go through that process over and over. And it's like, I get it. Like, a big part of Animal Crossing is just making things feel like they are taking time because it's a real world game and things should have like an impact on real world time in terms of like completing stuff. Uh, but this just feels like you could have streamlined this better. And maybe they do. Maybe there's like a better crafting table that does that down the line and I haven't unlocked it yet. And that's one of the things about this game is it's hard to talk about over just two weeks when it's a game you're supposed to play for months and months and like and ideally you're supposed to play it for years so it's hard to talk about but even in that capacity like i'm like it's a great game i have no doubt about that just based on this these two weeks it's going to be many people's favorite animal crossing ever for sure so now the most important question have you played ori yet no i haven't i i I, I, Every every time I would like I got a chance like something would happen with the kids or I would be like oh I really got to get this Animal Crossing review done or whatever so, uh, 
but I, th- I think you should have some time, like, maybe tonight, especially before um, Doom comes out. I'm playing that. Although I also got that VR game that you can't talk about. Uh, so, uh, that, although that's, like, that's, like, such a huge production. It's, like, I'll, I'll just set, set aside some time for Alex or whatever, and then I'll come back to Ori uh, any other time I get a chance. I just really want to play Ori on my TV in 4K, so I, like, have to, like, find time for that as well. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Although it does... You know, there are some benefits to playing that one on the PC because it'll run a little better. That's true. Yeah, I'll, I'll plug the PC into the TV. All right, cool. Uh, nothing else for me though. Not not really. Uh, how about you? Yeah. No, no, nothing. Nothing I can really talk about right now. Okay. Well, I think we should get out of here. Uh, come back next week and we'll talk about Doom and and whatever else. Uh, until then though, uh, why don't we tell everybody where they can find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at Tolkoto. T O L K O T O. And I'm Jeff Grubb on Twitter and Jeff Grubb on YouTube, or Jeffrey Grubb on YouTube, and then Jeff Grubb on Twitch. Uh, And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. Until then, have a good one and goodbye. Bye.